uh, you're listening to Beneath the Skin, a podcast about uh, the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. Um, as regular listeners will already have realised, um, this is a solo episode by me, Dr. Matt Lodder. Um, producer Tom is away on his holidays in Ireland right now, so he's left me uh, alone again to record um, my ramblings and thoughts uh, for the next hour or so. Um, we um, have been talking quite a lot, Tom and I, about um, you know trying to make sure that we diversify the podcast a bit um, over the last few months, um, primarily because it's sort of where I have to say most of my specific expertise is, and I always never want to present a deep knowledge about uh, cultures and experiences that are not my own um, without having an expert on to talk about that. Um, but nevertheless, we've been focused quite a lot on tattooing in the Western world and, and largely in the kind of more recent West. Um, that is something we definitely are aware of. We want to basically make sure we're a more diverse um, uh, going forward. We've got some really interesting diverse stuff coming up, including um, in the next few weeks, an episode for Pride, uh, talking about some some queer tattoo icons. We've talked about actually quite a lot about queer tattooing in recent months as well, but we're going to talk about some more um, and just try and make sure that we're not just talking about like white guys from Britain and America in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, however, um, basically, unfortunately, because this is, you're left with me and that, that really puts things right back in the, wheelhouse of what I um, am focused on. Um, I want to talk today about something that I have touched upon in passing. I think we may have even mentioned it in passing on some previous episodes. It comes up um, very briefly in passing uh, in my book, Painted People, um, available now in all good bookshops, actually out in paperback soon. It's coming out in paperback in September. Um, we'll talk more about that, I guess, um, when it's out. Um, I've also mentioned it in passing in an article that I wrote uh, for a book that came out in Japan. Um, but it's something that I've been working on. It's something that um, I've been rattling around for a long time. Those of you that follow me on social media, on Twitter or on Facebook, you may have seen some of this stuff as well. I have a year of research leave next year to try and write some stuff up um, that I've got in the pipeline. And one of the things is this paper to try and take some of these thoughts that I've mentioned in passing and to give them a more kind of concrete, um, serious art historical articulation. Um and so this week at university, I presented a kind of what we call a work in progress seminar. Um, and so when uh, Tom you know, pointed out that he was going to be away this week, I thought it was a good opportunity, again, just to kind of um, present some of that work to you guys and actually see if there's anything, um, you know, even kind of bring you in on the hunt, I suppose, because I'm always, as we'll talk about, um, this particular topic is about drawing some lots of dots together. Um we talk about the podcast, you know, as the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. And actually, I think this is actually a really good focus uh, for that idea, a good kind of test case for that specific idea, because I want to focus on a very specific design. Um, I could have picked other ones, but this, as we'll see, is particularly ubiquitous and has a particular kind of historical valence, has a particular kind of historical relevance. Um, and through that specific design, trace connections through history, uh, to technology, to global politics, to the relationships between high and low art. And actually to take something which I think most people who are tattooed, I'm sure most people who listen to this podcast are tattooed, um, most, most things that tattooed people understand quite instinctively, but which still sometimes come as a bit of a surprise um, to those people that are not. And in fact, when I gave this talk, as I said, this work in progress version of the talk this week, there was a PhD student in philosophy um, who found one of the basic premises of the of the idea quite surprising, which I'll get to. So um, we're going to also here, you know, be covering some stuff uh, in passing that we've touched upon in other episodes. This is a topic really, again, still based in the late 19th century um, and focusing on the relationships between Britain and Japan. And so if you've heard our series on on, on Japan, we touched upon that idea a bit. Um, in the latter part of the um, series, and it's come up, you know, in other places. I'm going to again be mentioning today some of the artists who I've worked a lot on who were working in London in the 19th century. Um, so some of this may be repetitious, but I want to. The whole point of this, in a way, is to go to take some of that general knowledge 
um, that I've presented in the book and I've presented in, in other publications and get a lot more granular with it, get a lot more specific and kind of try and figure out how when we apply these ideas to something very, very narrow, in the case, one specific tattoo design, um, we can get to some really interesting places. So that tattoo design is a little frog. Uh, a little frog that was first drawn, um, not as a tattoo design, but first drawn on paper by the Japanese uh, Japanese woodblock artist um, Hokusai, um, Katsushika Hokusai, who was a, a born at the end of the 18th century, um, died just before uh, the Meiji Restoration, just before this moment in the 1850s when Japan opened up to the West. He died in 1849. Um very, very, very famous. I'm sure most of you have heard of Hokusai or certainly his most famous works in particular, the kind of Great Wave, um, are going to be very familiar to people. He is like the kind of you know, acknowledged master of ukiyo-e prints. And again, we talked about ukiyo-e and tattooing in particular in a uh, in a discussion with um, Benoit Robitaille on the show, which you can again go back and listen to um, if you want a lot more detail on the context of ukiyo-e um, woodblock printing in 19th century Japan. Um, but so Hokusai um, is uh, one of the things he's famous for is this collection of drawings called the manga. And we have this word manga now um, in, in, uh, in, in English you know, to talk about Japanese um, illustration, I suppose, Japanese cartooning. Um, but in the context of Hokusai's manga, the, the word doesn't refer to that kind of thing it doesn't refer to this kind of storytelling style this comic book storytelling it's really just a kind of selection of drawings of sketches actually hundreds and hundreds of sketches of of everyday life in um, edo uh, tokyo of um, flora and fauna of birds of insects um of all kinds of things he even did some sex toys um uh woodblock prints supernatural folk tales all of these things which because I sketched and then they were cut into wood blocks and printed in these bound volumes, um, which become known as the manga. Um, there's some debate actually about whether Hokusai laid them out on a page or whether he just did the drawings and it was his woodblock cutters, his apprentices, who laid them out on the page. But um, in any case, these um, books, these series of manga, which were first published um in around about 1814, and then in several um, issues, several um, volumes over the course of the um, next few decades, uh, they became very, very, very popular, right? So um, the first few have this kind of almost like art training vibe to them, which I'll, I'll come to over the course of this talk. That, you know, they were designed in some senses for Hokusai to explain how he worked, um, and then they became these um, sort of visual primers to to contemporary art, then contemporary art in Japan. And because their publication is in the immediate decades, and Hokusai's life is in the immediate decades before the opening up to the West, when um, Europeans, Americans opened Japan to Western trade um, fully in the 1850s, they were like the thing that was really uppermost in the popular imagination about Japanese art. And so they became hugely influential. Um, and um, there's a particular origin story uh, through which essentially they even become the wellspring of everything that follows in terms of um, modern art in general, right? So one of the people really influenced when Hokusai's work reached Europe, for example, was Van Gogh. Uh, and the standard story about Van Gogh's um, work and from that all of what we call modernism in art history is that, you know, the newness, um, the, the, this kind of break with, with European perspectival forms, this engagement with colour, with graphic um, style, with um, kind of everyday storytelling of everyday life. All of that stuff is very compelling Um in, in Europe and Van Gogh and others take Hokusai's work and other work coming from Japan, um, incorporate it, adapt it into their own practice. And then from there, you know, we're off to the races, basically. Um, that, that leads into all of the, the art that follows, art and culture that follows. Um, in terms of tattooing, though, there's also this really interesting um, thing that happens. So this frog, 
as I said, it's one of the manga. And um, in uh, 1866, so about 10 years after um, Japan is opened up, not quite even 10 years after Japan is opened to the West, um, everything Japanese, including Japanese antiques, are becoming very, very fashionable in Europe. And so the story goes, and this is apocryphal, um, but it's the sort of standard story that gets told. This French ceramic dealer called Eugène Rousseau commissioned uh, a designer, a guy called Félix Braquemont, to design um, a set of porcelain plates for the Paris World's Fair, which was going to be in 1867. Now, World's Fairs were basically ways for designers, um, inventors, artists, and others um, to exhibit their work. Um, exhibit their goods. It was sort of a, an economic generator for a particular host country. It was a sort of celebration of um, progress during the Industrial Revolution because this is also a time of great um, innovation in terms of things like electricity and manufacturing, um, uh, of urbanisation. People are flocking into cities. You know, the, the, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing as well and the World's Fairs are a big part of, of sort of celebrating and commercialising that, right? And so... Um, basically, all of this uh, stuff's being imported into um, France, but all the good stuff's running out already. Right? There's not a huge amount of ex of, of um, antique Japanese, authentic antique Japanese ceramic ware available for export. And so Rousseau realizes that he can create his own version, or at least commission Brackmore to create his own version. And so Brackmore, so the story goes. Um, imported some authentic ceramics with the view to kind of copying them. And they came packed in these shipping crates straight from Japan. And in order to protect the delicate ceramic ware during shipping, the Japanese exporter had wrapped all of this precious stuff in pieces of scrap paper. And the scrap paper, so the story goes, happens to have been pages cut from an edition of Hokusai's manga. Um, the, as I said, the manga had come out, um, uh, so the first one, especially in 1814, so it was kind of old by that point. And um, it was just used for packing material. However, um, Brackmore was like, astonished, you know, as I as I said, in the same way as Van Gogh might have been, you know, would go on to be, um, by the beauty and the elegance and the kind of ex- interest and excitement of these designs. And he realised that actually the Hokusai manga were more interesting, more exciting than what was on the imported tableware. So he realised that he could take these kind of random drawings, he could take these clippings, he could cut them out, he could make um, transfers from them and he could transfer them onto the ceramic ware. Uh, and this created basically what's become known as the Service Rousseau, um, after um, Rousseau, the patron. Um, they were presented at the World's Fair in 1868 and were hailed as this absolutely incredible, incredible moment of of, of Western meets Japanese design, of the decorative and the everyday coming together, of beauty and industry coming together. Um, and again, so the story kind of goes like this is what kick started modernism, right? Bringing the Japanese and the Oriental and the novel and the surprising and, 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 the, and the beautiful into things like, you know, plates that everyone could. Could buy. Um, now, as I said, that's l- probably apocryphal, um, but it's a story that's been told, and it kind of makes sense. And on one of the plates, on one of the um, side plates of the service Rousseau, is this little frog. Um, this little frog cut straight from um, one of Hokusai's manga, volume one, in fact, from 1814. Uh, the frog appears on this page um, in Hokusai alongside butterflies and grasshoppers and snails and on the other page a snake a lizard and and various other kind of creepy crawlies um frogs also you know they they have a kind of interesting history themselves in japanese art um those of you that saw the um 
Kiyosai um, exhibition, uh, sorry, um, uh, Kuniyoshi exhibition at the British Museum. Last year, we'll have seen, like, he was very famous for doing lots of frogs. Frogs in in Japanese, and as I said in a previous episode here, I can't speak Japanese, so my pronunciation is terrible. But basically, the Japanese for frog is something like kairu, kairu and um, it's a homon- homonym um, pun for the word return, which was also something like kairu, kairu. Sorry to anyone Japanese listening. <laughs> but basically the, the words are pronounced the same, spelt differently. Um, but that means that frogs become symbols of return. So they get used a lot, for example, for logos, for travel companies. Uh, and also, you know, they become a kind of symbol of like good luck, good fortune returning. Um, so, yeah, these like this, this little frog from Hokusai's manga ends up on this side plate this service in the service Rousseau. It also actually um, becomes an absolute staple of this French uh, glassware designer from the period called, called Eugène Gallet. And Gallet, again, sort of directly lifted from Hokusai uh, this frog and he, he etched it onto a glass vase. He made a very um, influential little kind of uh, like it's called a vide poche, like a little kind of pocket emptying dish, you know, that you could chuck your keys into or whatever, uh, made out of glass, which also included a direct kind of glass representation of this Hokusai frog. And so the frog becomes like this icon of this moment of cultural interaction between the West and the East. Um, now, in terms of process, right, like cutting out stuff from books and sticking it onto ceramic ware and other things had been already a bit of a craze. Um, in, in French, initially, it was called potichomanie, potichomania, potiche being the name for this particular kind of Orientalist Chinese-style vase. Um, and it was such a kind of craze, you know, mania, many, that um, there were cartoons you know, in the French press imagining women at home so obsessed with cutting stuff out and sticking them on pots that you know, they could they, they couldn't sleep or they were you know even looking you know neglecting their children so this had also come you know in the in the decades since japan had opened up to the west uh, this had come uh, basically in the same kind of moment of cultural excitement where amateurs were buying kits essentially um to make and stick their own. They, they, they couldn't find or afford any of this imported um, Chinaware either, but they wanted it. It was very fashionable, and so they could make it themselves at home, and it was, it was a, bit of a, a bit of a fad, a bit of a fashion, um, either by copying, painting these designs on, or, or later on even, as I said, buying kind of ready-made transfers. These ready-made transfers, um, as I go into in Painted People, were called uh, decalcomani, decalcomania, it's where, the, where we get the word decal from. So, okay. So we've got, uh, even before the Soviet Union, so a kind of decade-long history of people in, uh, cutting out stuff, even sort of chinese stuff, and sticking it on anything they can get their hands on. Um, this is also a really interesting history. You know, and again, I, 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 I talked in the introduction here, and I, I joke um, uh, all the time, um, and it's the reason we, we call the podcast the history of everything through the history of tattooing. We get some weird places, but this is intimately linked also to kind of a serendipitous, you know, lucky, temporarily lucky or temporary coincident invention of a lithographic process, which allows you to put coloured designs on the transfer paper, stick them with water, um, and then transfer them onto another surface. That was invented in 1856 just before Japan is opened up to the West. So it's this new process invented um, by uh, uh, an English or a London-based, at least, um, inventor called uh, Gottkotro, C.G. Gottkotro, who pasted a process of coating paper with starch that allowed transfer of multicolored prints onto another surface. Um, There had been um, kind of decals uh, by that point for about, 50 years um early patents come from like the 1790s with lithography which is like you know the transformation of a design to another surface by chemical process um and then the um, creation of transfers to put things onto wood and tin in the 1820s um and that word decalque uh, which means like to trace or to copy by tracing 
um, also comes from uh, around about the late 18th, early 19th century, this guy called Simon Francois Ravenet. But basically, we've got this new technology, right, of printing onto a particular kind of specialized paper, which then by a process of application of, of water or other kind of solvents would transfer that design onto whatever you stuck it on. And here, just after Japan opens up to the West, is a whole new suite of images of small designs, perfectly, you know, in a way suited in an ironic way to this kind of transfer process. So we eventually have, right, this perfect storm of new fashions in design, in Japanese design, new intersections between kind of, you know, the homegrown and the high art. So you can take this high art form and you can um, you know, take it home with you and make it yourself. And also the technology to produce that. And all of that is this um, trend of, of decalcomanie, decalcomania. Um, I haven't actually yet found, and this is almost the final piece of the puzzle, I haven't actually found a, a direct kit selling this frog as a decalcomania design. Um, but certainly there are other similar you know, designs in some of these commercial um, books. You could write off, send some money, go into a shop, buy a book of designs um, for your decalcomania practice at home. Um, there's another wrinkle here, which is uh, linguistic, and I'm going to go into this in the book in a lot more detail. But to cut a long story short, um, as soon as these designs started being sold on transfer paper, these decals, um, there was newspaper reports of kids sticking them on their arms to look like tattoos. They weren't designed like that to do that, of course, but but kids being kids thought that would be fun. Um, they're trying to ape these tattoo trends by you know by 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 sticking these things on themselves. Um, and of course, then that became a uh, manufacturers realized this could be a commercial process. They started specifically selling transfer tattoos um, in the United States. You know, but they came in bubblegum packets and, and all kinds of things for kids specifically to kind of tattoo themselves with, so to speak. Um, so the story goes, in the early 20th century, young kids in Yiddish-speaking parts of New York City couldn't say decalcomania. So that became cockamamies. Um, and if you've heard that word cockamamie as an adjective, it means something like crazy or stupid or harebrained or or ridiculous. Well, that word cockamamie comes from the act of sticking these little designs that you buy from a corner store for a penny and sticking on your arm, um, which I think is a lovely little bit of linguistic coincidence. So we have all these things lining up, right? Technology, global politics, trade, fashion, invention, language. Um, and yeah, this frog, which becomes like, as I said, iconic. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you really like Beneath the Skin and you want to help support us, you can do so on Patreon. For as little as five quid a month, you can help make this show possible, help us buy research materials. So if you like the show and you want to support us, consider kicking us a few quid a month. And you'll get everything from bonus episodes to Q&As. And you can even vote on what tattoo I'll get when we reach a certain subscriber count. Matt, have you got anything to say? You should really definitely uh, fund the Patreon because tattoo history is massive, right? Deep, wide, complicated. We're covering some big hit topics on the main feed, but on the Patreon subscriber only feed, we'll be getting into some really more interesting niche, deep topics you don't want to miss out on. And honestly, the chance to kind of decide what Thomas gets on his body is probably just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Subscribe, chuck us a few quid. Don't miss out on this chance to ruin Thomas's body forever. Everyone knows that tattoo aftercare is one of the most important steps in getting a new tattoo. We all want our fresh new tattoos to heal as easily and hassle free as possible so we can show them off to the world. That's why Sanoderm's here to help. Driven by science and innovation, Sanoderm products have been thoroughly tested and used by doctors and tattoo artists alike for over 10 years. Sanoderm brings cutting edge technology to make your tattoo healing process a breeze. No more messing around with cleaning and plastic every few hours with Sanoderm's amazing range of aftercare products. I personally have used Sanoderm to heal my tattoos in the past and they made what used to be a daily process of setting reminders on my phone to clean and rewrap my tattoo into a one-step process. Their medical grade products include aftercare balms, soaps, and my favorite, their second skin aftercare bandages. 
Sonoderm's tattoo bandages are designed to be waterproof, breathable, and keep your new tattoo protected from whatever the elements can throw at it so you can get on with your day worry-free and confident your new tattoo will look vibrant and will heal faster. Plus, their products are all natural and ethically sourced, so you can take comfort in knowing that you're healing your tattoos with nature's finest ingredients. So next time you're in an artist's chair, why not try Sanoderm, healing your tattoos the modern way so you can get on with your day. Check out the link in the description of this episode for discounts on a range of Sanoderm products or for more information. So from from the um, service Russo and from the influence of people like Galley, um, and because these Hokusai designs become just published over and over and over again in magazines, in fact, the story of Van Gogh is that he saw some Hokusai designs in a, in a magazine called Art et Industrie, published in Paris. They were published in popular editions, um, uh, reproduced all over the place, and became basically the kind of visual staple of popular culture in Europe in the 18. Um, uh, 80s really 70s 80s and 90s and of course tattooers are we don't have flash at this time um some some tattoo artists were producing um certainly in the late 19th century were producing drawing books and sketchbooks and in the early 20th century as this technology for reprodu- reproducing things becomes more easily available um, tattooers would use this kind of transfer process to actually sell stencils as part of how to tattoo kits. But um, in the first decades of the professional tattoo industry in the 1880s in the UK, for example, um, most tattooers will have been assembling design books rather than producing commercial flash. And that would be essentially scrapbooking. They'd collect designs that they'd find in, um, in newspapers, on greetings cards, uh, in in, uh, in magazines, all kinds of visual sources that they could then show to their clients um, as inspiration for designs, and they would sometimes customize them or sometimes transfer them directly. And there's a lot of work. I've done some stuff on this, and there are some good Instagram accounts as well, which look at, you know, find print sources for tattoo designs. Um, in London, you know, Sutherland MacDonald and, and Tom Riley and Alf South and others were using, um, amongst other things, like sporting pictures, pictures by artists who were selling prints of things like pheasant hunts and um, you know duck hunts and things, images that were sort of the visual culture at the time. But also because, as we talked about in that Japan episode, part of the fascination with Europe, um, with Japan, was the tattooing, of course, um, Japanese designs became of interest. Um, and this is, uh, you know, something again, which I alluded to at the beginning of this recording, like people who are tattooed understand this. The images that you get tattooed on yourself are images that are from your visual life world, right? They're images which exist in the visual culture environment from which you emerge, right? Like you're inspired by images, even if they're sometimes other tattoos, I suppose, but you're inspired to tattoo on you images which um, are around you in the world. And we find that, of course, in ancient tattoo traditions too. You know, we can trace some continuity between the visual cultures of the Scythians and their tattoos, um, for example. But um, this idea that, you know, tattooing is a kind of process of visual magpieing is not something that's that common in writing about tattooing or thinking about tattooing. Who, uh, uh, When I gave this talk last week, um, I was talking about these crossovers, as I said, between tattooing and the visual arts and the commercial visual arts in the 19th century. And this uh, student said to me, yeah, but, t- but tattoos aren't like... You know, buying a pot, and I had to say, well, no, of course, of course, it's not. There are specific, phenomenal things about the process of tattooing. You know, the fact it's on you permanently, the fact it hurts, the fact that, that it changes your body, and and all, all these kind of things are very important parts of the medium of tattooing. But um, I think, I guess, my overall argument is tattooing is much more like a, um, another commercial art form than people realise. You know how we can ascribe and do and should ascribe meaning and importance to the magic and beauty of the process, but the images themselves come from a particular place and they come from the um, visual cultures around us, right? And um, we talked a bit about that in our interview with the Russian um, tattoo guys as well last week. So, of course, all that means is one of the sources that, for example, Sutherland MacDonald and Tom Riley are looking for inspiration in is these Japanese popular books. Um, I found a letter actually in the British Museum uh, archives that Alfred South, who was 
Riley and um, McDonald's great rival, that he'd written to Sidney Colville, who was the curator at the British Museum, to basically ask, like, hey, my clients want, like, authentic Japanese designs. Can you recommend any good designs to me, um, any good books that I can look at? Colville's response, if, if any, wasn't recorded. But we can see there that evidences, I think, that um, these artists are interested in finding um, interesting and unique sources of designs for their customers. Um, artists like Riley were even inviting Japanese artists to come and work with them in London. Um, uh, Hori Toyo, uh, Peter Kudo, uh, uh, was invited by Riley f- um, to work in his studio for a while, who, and he then went, went on to work in uh, the States. And, you know, again, the idea, like, actually being as Japan, as Japan was really driving this trend um, for being tattooed, um, being as Japanese as possible in your presentation was actually going to be very useful as a commercial strategy for artists, um, particularly those that are quite far away from Japan, right? Because you can, your customers, your wealthy customers can come in and get tattooed uh, in a Japanese style from you without having to go all the way to Japan. Um, McDonald, for example, laid out his studio in a Japanese style. Um, he had sort of divan beds. There are photos of his tools, which are... Uh, and of Riley as well, actually, were ex- explicitly captioned, you know, tattooing in the Japanese manner with, with hand tools. So these things are coming together, right? Taste, industry, technology, language, um, fashion are all coming together in this little frog. And the frog basically becomes this um, very kind of you know, constant design um, in British tattooing in particular, right? So a version of it... Um, Actually, by one of Hokusai's pupils called Hakushi, painted on silk, was first acquired by the British Museum in 1881. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that that's also coincident with the, the rise of professional tattooing, you know, in both directions. Professional tattooing happens because people are interested in, in Japan and um, the British Museum's acquiring it for the same reason. And we can speculate that, you know... Um, Maybe artists like McDonald and Riley and South went to the museum and saw this kind of thing on display. Um, Hokushi's is a much more fleshed out version, you know, painted rather than just drawn in outline. But we first kind of see the design crop up, I think, or the, the clearest version. And I think this is actually the version that is specifically the source for lots of the others that follow is a version of it that was published in um, Harmsworth Pictorial Monthly magazine in 1898. So by this point, you know, we're sort of a decade or even nearly two decades on. Um, It's no longer this kind of cutting edge thing. It's sort of seeped into everyday culture in a way. It's no longer really necessarily even a Japanese design by this point. It's just kind of a fashionable design. Um, It was published in this article called uh, uh, Tattooed Royalty, Queer Stories of a Queer Craze in Harmsworth Monthly in 1898 with the subtitle Design Tattooed on Prince Francis of Tech. Lots of the British royal family and other royal families from around the world were tattooed in Japan, um, and lots of tattooers in Europe and America claimed um, to have been, you know, where they went to get tattooed when they wanted more when they came to Europe. There's no actual real evidence that many any of these guys um, were tattooed in Europe, but it made good advertising copy. <laughs> so Riley, in this article, this article um, uh, is. You know, basically lays out the story of, of of royal patronage of tattooing in Europe, and in it, Riley claims to have tattooed Prince Francis of Tech with this particular frog design, and the frog is clearly kind of traced. It's got a little um, uh, it's got a little fly next to it as well, but the frog is clearly directly drawn um, from Hokusai. It's an exact trace. Now, copies of this magazine were clearly collected. Lots of tattooers, as I said, were collecting print sources, and that included. Thankfully, from my point of view as a historian, collecting every article they could find that was ever published around tattooing. And for example, we find examples of this um, magazine in the collection of, amongst other people, George Burchett, who also did a version. Um, we find this little frog uh, reproduced on the arm of one of Riley's customers. Um, uh, from 1903, this photograph of, quote unquote, a German lady well known in society who may have been a German lady well-known in society, or who may have actually just been a, um, a performing woman from the circus who was claiming to be a, um, a, an aristocrat in order to help Riley drive up his client base. 
uh, she has her face covered in the um, in the image. But she's got, amongst other things, this frog on her arm. Um, it comes up in an advert in 1904 in Badminton Magazine, a, a, a magazine targeted at a kind of sporting set. Um, Riley and South and McDonald would often advertise there, and similar magazines, Sporting Life, Country, um, Country uh, Life, all these kind of magazines that are aimed, Tatler, these magazines that are aimed at kind of an upper middle class set. Um, Riley has an advert in the 1904, um, uh, in a 1904 edition of Badminton Magazine, which includes a, 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 a photograph of a snake eating this frog. Um, then we find it, um, a version of it or in a version by McDonald. McDonald um, responded actually in the papers in, with outrage at that Harmsworth magazine article saying, Riley didn't tattoo the royal family. I tattooed the royal family. Um, on one of his business cards, one of his customers, there's a similar frog, although it's not quite so directly lifted from Hokusai, but I think that um, the design, this snake snatching at a leaping frog is clearly, I think, McDonald's attempt to like one-up Riley <laughs> to try and kind of, um, you know, show that he's doing better. Um, we find, uh, we find um, other versions of it uh, tattooed on the chest of a guy called Sailor Jack, for example. Um who was a tattooer from Liverpool. There are, um, I just took delivery of a couple of amazing new books, one by Rich Hardy um, of a flash book by Ben Corday, the Anglo-American touring tattooer, um, who also has a version of this in his book. And there's also a, a version of it, really kind of crudely traced, I have to say, in a flash book from Norway, in a new book put out by um, Tor Ole Svenning, um, which you should also check out. Hopefully we'll get him on the podcast soon to talk about that amazing find. But this, um, those frogs, I think, the versions, for example, in Corday and in Svenning's work and many of the others, I think will have been traced from that Harmsworth article and not from Riley directly. So we have, we have not from um, Hokusite directly. So we have, again, this interesting kind of layer of, of influence, right, from, from, from print and decoration to tattooing, and then it filters into becoming a more straightforward like tattoo design. Um, then really fascinatingly, and this is something that I um, I really find amazing, when I went to Japan, and I talked about this um, last summer, when I went to Japan to look at these flashbooks from 1908 from this artist in Nagasaki um, called uh, Ikasaki, in his design books, you can see that he's trying to sell himself market himself to a european audience tattooing was um, illegal uh, except if you were tattooing europeans so many many tattoo artists who remained in japan had to make a living by basically marketing themselves towards europeans um, and his flashbook includes loads of designs that are very specifically aimed at europeans you know britannias and american eagles but in that book there's also a frog um again pretty closely modeling the Hokusai version. Um, the other really interesting artist in this story is a guy called Hori Chio. And we mentioned him uh, when we talked uh, to uh, Pascal Bago about his book, The Tattoo Writer. Hori Chio claimed to have been the tattoo artist who tattooed George V when he was in Japan in 1881. There's some debate around that. Um, Japanese scholars disagree about whether Hori Chio was the guy actually responsible. But Whatever the case, Hori Chio became, in the latter part of the 19th century, at this time of kind of increased European interest in the practice, the most famous Japanese artist, tattoo artist in the world. You could go to, to Yokohama um, uh, uh, and, you could, or you could, and you could find um, in guidebooks to Japan mentions of Hori Chio. Um, Annie Crocker, this big socialite who um, was tattooed in New York by Hori Toyo, also mentioned in her autobiography, going to Japan and, and at least meeting Hori Chio. So he's this like absolute global legend uh, and to the point where other tattooers claim to be him who can't possibly have been. Um, and in Hori Chio's designs that survive, um, some of which survive in museum in Japan, but many of which are in the private collection of the Tattoo Museum in Yokohama, um, there is another version of the Hokusai frog. And I need to do a bit more careful thinking about the timeline, but I'm pretty convinced 
that that design will have come back into Japanese tattooing through its influence in the West. I'm, I don't know yet. I need to have a more careful think, but it seems to me more likely that these are designs that are being aimed at European customers rather than things that were part of the tradition of Japanese tattooing before European contact, which we talked about in that previous episode. So there's this absolutely like incredible circuit of designs back and forward through tattooing, uh, through through print sources, through decorative sources, through European tattooing, and potentially back into Japanese tattooing. Or at least certainly there's this kind of um, shared sense of design amongst European and Japanese tattoo artists, which is based in these print sources. Um, and I think that story, right, this one little frog which crops up everywhere and has become, you know, over the course of the 20th century, just a staple. You find it on on flash sheets. Um, uh, someone pointed out to me that Horihide, a 20th century Japanese tattooer, also um, had a version of it. It's just sort of everywhere, this little frog. And what it does for me in my in my mind is is connect tattooing to like everything else, right? It connects tattooing to mainstream culture, high fashion. Um, it allows us to think about tattooing as a artistic process, or certainly a process of image acquisition. Um, where yes, you can read into those designs, and you should read into those designs great symbolism and meaning, um, great resonance of of as I said, for example, luck or travel, or you know, frogs are also like butterflies, great symbols of transformation, the, the tadpole to the to the frog. Um, and so they're really they have they they're, they're, they're symbols which are imbued with a lot of meaning. In fact, I even found evidence of a frog, not this specific frog, being tattooed even in European tattooing before Japanese um, encounter, right? Like in in a um, in the digital panopticon of, of prisoner records, I found an example from 1827 on a guy called George Stubbs transported for horse theft to Tasmania, um, Van Diemen's Land in 1827, so four decades before the opening of Japan. And on his arm, amongst other things, um, is a uh, is a frog. So frogs were clearly even part of the European tattoo lexicon. Um, it's not we didn't get the idea of tattooing frogs on yourself from the Japanese. But this specific frog, this design, and how it connects tattooing to moments of technological change, of um, of, of rhetoric, of innovation, and even of, of as I said, of language, is just a fascinating example of, of what more broadly I'm interested in as a story about tattooing, right? How tattooing is, how the history of tattooing is the history of everything else. And there's something to finish this idea up. There's something quite compelling to me about the similarities between Felix Blackmore cutting out that little frog and pasting it onto a ceramic ware plate and Tom Riley cutting out that frog from the same book and sticking it on the arm of potentially the father-in-law of the Queen of England. Um, the processes even are the same. And even when you think about someone, something like Emile Gallet, the, the, the glassware designer who I mentioned at the beginning, who was obsessed with this frog, um, glass engraving and tattooing mechanically share, in some senses, the same tool set sometimes. Um, so that's, uh, that's the basic um, shape of the argument. Um, there's some more little wrinkles that I need to think more carefully about. I need to look pr- precisely if I can find this frog in amateur decalcomania books. Um, I need to think more carefully about, for example, this little nice little homophonic thing where the word in Greek for stigma um, is comes initially, you know, which comes to mean in Greek, the word for tattooing, um, but which also, of course, in modern parlance in English means like, you know, a kind of something bad about your character. Um, that was stigma initially originally applied in Greek to the marks on the skin of a reptile, um, like a snake or a frog. So there's even this kind of interesting, deep, spiritual kind of, you know, universal engagement between frogs uh, and tattooing, although that's probably a leap too far and I don't want to push it too much. Um, that That's a probably a bit more metaphysical than I usually want to get with my art historical analysis. But for me, 
you know, as I said, I've traced the kind of historical context of this in, in exhaustive detail in print um, a number of times. But anchoring this in a specific art history, which allows us to, to link technological change, decorative, amateur practice, industrialized practice, high art, and then avant-gardism through fashion, through design and through tattooing, like to do that art historically with a specific image um, is something which only an art historical approach can do and which I find um, hopefully will be very surprising to people. Um, I, when I was first thinking about this idea, I did show some of these images um, to Tim Clark, who's the curator at the British Museum, who exhibited the Hokusai work, and he's a world expert on Hokusai. He also has some interest in tattooing, actually. He was a correspondent of Ed Hardy's for a while. Um, but this came as news to him, right? The fact that Hokusai was this um, wellspring of designs for tattooing. And there are others, you know, other things from the manga as well. As I said, I picked the frog, but there are, there's a Hokusai catfish that McDonald uses that's also taken up actually by Galley uh, on glassware. There are cockerels, um, there's certainly a lot of the little figures. And there's a fishing boy um that mcdonald's lifted into a composition like lots of tattooers clearly had copies if not of the manga themselves certainly of the popular reproductions of them or when they were reproduced in magazines um scrapbooking them using them as designs and it became this absolute staple you know um and i you find it everywhere um so yeah so if you see this little frog please let me know if you um uh, have collections of 19th or 20th century flash or photographs of tattooing in the early part of the 20th century, um, and you see this little frog come up, I'd be really, really thrilled um, to, to see where you find it. Um, there is a slight issue that actually a lot of frogs look the same, and if you pose it with one leg down and one leg up as if it's about to leap, they look quite similar. Um, I'm happy for general frogs in that pose, um, but you can see when this specific frog has been traced. Um, and, and it's that connection i suppose actually of the contemporary of tattooing as this acquisitive art of this art of copying which i talk about in that interview i did with ed um and the article that i published around the same time actually new old style which talks about the relationship of tattooers and tattoo collectors through images to previous generations this frog this little frog uh, connects us right back uh, almost to the start of of the birth of western professional tattooing um so thank you for listening. Um, I know these um, solo episodes are a bit a, diff a different experience to listen to than the kind of banter that Tom and I have. Um, I try not to script um, because I don't want to be reading out a script. And I hope they still come across as comprehensible, that people do make it through to the end. Um, I also want to mention thank you to those of you that have made it to the end. Thank you to our patrons, as always. Thank you to our sponsor, Saniderm. Um, if you are interested in subscribing to the show, you can go on our Patreon um, and get access to episodes first, get access to episodes that we don't release on the main feed. Um, and we're also releasing merch. Um, so we're going to, um, we've, we've had some amazing designs done up for t-shirts. We're going to pro um, produce um, a line of t-shirts for pre-order in the next few weeks. Keep your eyes peeled uh, on the podcast and on, the, on our socials. Um, this incredible design celebrating the, the show. Um, we'll be printing them in inclusive sizes, so right the way up to like several XL. Um, and yeah, um, it'd be really great if you could, uh, could get involved with that. We're really, really like, honestly, as I've said many, many times, if I didn't talk about what I did, it would be less a career and more of a mania, um, a decalicomania, if you like. Um, and I'm really, really grateful to the messages and the communications that I've been getting from people. And I know Tom has too, from listeners to the show. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Tom for editing this. Enjoy the rest of your holiday, buddy. Um, thank you for listening. And um, we will speak to you all very soon. Bye-bye.